Um, but they do not have resources to carry these, carry out the action to do those things. Um, so if you go to this web page here, you'll see there's a new government policy being launched um, recently, um, where there's a parity for our country process, where $2.25 billion funding has been committed over, um, over the next five years. And the aim is to integrate a number of existing natural resource management um, programs. Uh, these include the National Heritage Trust, the National Land Care Program, and the Environmental Stewardship Program, and the elements of the Working on Country Program. So the Working on Country Program is something I'll say more about later. It's a, 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 a policy involved in working with Indigenous peoples, specifically on uh, land management processes. And it's interesting this new government policy is much more holistic in trying to bring uh, those issues in together uh, in terms of involving Indigenous people in mainstream environmental policy processes. Uh, if, you go to that, if, if you go to that web page, you'll see that the program is also a way of implementing election um, promises. So remember I was talking about in the policy uh, development lecture about how policy gets developed in, often in, in election cycles. So the current government made the, the promise to do these things in, in the election campaign, and all these things are now rolled into this new um, policy setting. So um, maybe that's a good way to do it. Maybe it's uh, um, an awkward and, and not the most logical way to do it because some of these things perhaps um, might be stretching uh, and might be changing the focus of the policy if you're stressing these particular <coughs> things rather than some of the broader holistic approach to stress in the policy. But again, you can see there's quite a strong uh, emphasis there. This is just the main uh, eight points listed there. You can see again quite a strong focus on Indigenous issues. Um, the, the, the third last point is interesting in terms of employing additional Indigenous ranges. So most of the Indigenous people involved in land management in Northern and Central Australia were employed under the Community Development Employment Program, CDEP, and the majority of them lost their jobs late last year as a result of the changes in the Community Development Employment uh, Project funding uh, for the previous government. So the land is a good example of, to explore both the successes and also the barriers to community participation. So I'm certainly not saying uh, land care has been perfect or that is, that is, uh, everything's all roses in land care. There's been many, many problems and it's a very good case study which I hope people will explore in the tutorials of both the successes and the limitations of community participation. So it offers a quite a radical model of community empowerment and involvement in natural resource management, which I would argue can be applied to many other settings. That's something I'd like people to think through in the tutorials. Um, but the problems are, are many. And one is in particular is the issue which some of you have got to, I think, in that exercise, on, on who should pay for uh, things that are done for the collective benefit. So a farmer at the top of the catchment who is uh, doing the right thing to stop soil erosion or to stop weeds going downstream is doing something, in some cases, which doesn't make economic sense for him or her, but it makes a lot of sense for the wider catchment or the wider community. So there's some quite thorny issues all through environmental policy and planning about who should pay and working out models of individual benefit, uh, individual cost, and how you, how you attribute those. Um, I've done a fair bit of research with land care groups around Braidwood, and it's interesting if you go out there, you can see now, you can actually see 10 years after land care, you can see the influence of land care in terms of tree plantings uh, around that area. Uh, but one interesting thing is the majority of that work has been done on public land. And the farmers out there felt that they would be criticised if they took land care dollars and spent on their individual farms, um, where in actual case that perhaps was the most sensible thing to do. But a lot of the, um, a lot of the works, a lot of the early works in land care have been in high profile, prominent places, often on public land, often on roadsides, in an attempt to um, to engender change by having things that are very visible along roadsides, but also um, to counter arguments of people feathering their own nest by taking land care money and improving their own properties. When, when in many cases it would make sense that money might be better spent on individual properties, um, but there's great sensitivity in rural Australia about seeing to being in favour. So land care is trying to address a land degradation crisis that's facing Australia. It's very hard to put a costing on it, but it is a recent, a recent, recent figure. It looks at it $2 billion annually uh, in terms of restoration works and at least uh, well over a billion dollars in terms of lost production. So by one of the figures, look at it, land degradation in Australia is a huge problem. Uh, and it's one of these many examples where 
where the economics seems to make sense to actually just spend a bit of money because in the long run you'll be saving things if you can address all the problems. The thing that interests me in terms of land degradation is just how long there has been problems in Australia and how hard it has been to address these problems. Uh, those who have done the first year course with me, with me with every lecture about problems that were emerging in the Sydney region in the 1820s in terms of the soil capacity being used up in that area and then people moving on to another area. So in Australia we have a long history of using up resources in, in unsustainable ways and then moving on to new areas. Uh, and, and of course what's happened in Australia now there aren't really many areas to move on to. There's still some land clearance occurring in the Brigalow Bill in Queensland. Um, a lot of the major salinity problems I know some of you are going to focus on in the um, tutorials relate to land clearance in the 60s and 70s in Western Australia. So the big uh, uh, dry land salinity areas in Western Australia was on clearance then. Uh, but back in Western Australia in the 80s, uh, there was problems with drifting sand and there was royal commissions to see what could be done in terms of managing the, um, uh, the range lands in Australia. Uh, there was se severe soil erosion in the 1920s and 1930s, so classic sort of photos of dust bowls of uh, farm country being blown away. Uh, they led in, in the case of New South Wales to establish the first soil conservation agency in Australia in 1938. Uh, but the really interesting thing about uh, the public policy responses to land degradation in Australia, and I'd argue around the world, is they're usually too late. They're after the event. They're trying to play catch up. Um, so they're not anticipating problems, they're reacting to problems. So again, when you're analysing effective policies, and that's what the focus of this course is, you need to think through which ones have been anticipatory and try to solve problems as they're occurring, rather than being reactive and responding too late. Um, and land care is different in the sense that it's it, it potentially at least it can be preventive rather than reactive policy approach. That's, that's the potential. In, in fact, as I'll go on to say, often land care, you know, people often don't get motivated to join a land care uh, group until there's a huge major problem. And often that is too late. Um, the first um, national survey of land degradation was done in 1975, and the figures there are quite extraordinary in terms of proportion of land requiring treatment for soil degradation. So you can see New South Wales has a very large proportion of its land surface needing soil treatment. So the interesting thing with that is, as I just told you, New South Wales has the longest history of having a soil conservation agency. So the state with the longest history of the soil conservation agency <coughs> had the worst problem in terms of percentages of problems that per area that needed to be addressed. <coughs> so what does that suggest to you about that technical fix approach of, of, of the soil conservation agency? And clearly there's something wrong with that, that model. Um, another, another interesting thing about um, soil, soil degradation, land degradation in Australia, is the role the government policy has played in creating the policy in the first place. I think here's a quote um, from Andrew Campbell, who has, has mentioned, mentioned his name before, um, he's the National Land Care Facilitator. He was the original land, National Land Care Facilitator. Then he went on to head Land and Water Australia. Uh, and he, he just came back two weeks ago and gave a really good lecture of Clearship um, Plants, which you can all see. If we, I'll just show you how to get to it if you're interested. Um, so if you Google my name, which is Baker ANU, and then click on Teaching, you'll see um, all my courses are listed there. Click on stress one thousand and one. It's got the same web page structure as this course. And if you go down to um, if you go down to March the eleventh, uh, you can see that all the first year courses this year have the have the lectures up there on YouTube. So you can see what he had to say. It's a very interesting lecture uh, about land care policy in Australia. Um, so he, he writes about um, how tax concessions for, for clearing native vegetation, drought assistance schemes, close settlement schemes, uh, inappropriate subdivision of land, ill-conceived, bad design, and poorly managed irrigation schemes are all examples of policy-driven constraints to sustainability. So government policy in the past has played a major role in land degradation problems in Australia. Um, so again, in the first year course, there will be a panel coming up with Linda Botchell talking about uh, drought assistance 
schemes in Australia and how we have a long history of encouraging people 